Good evening, everybody. Welcome. It's good to see you. Did everybody get enough to eat and have enough to drink? Good. Welcome. Um, I'm Lucy Langer, president of Compass Oncology, and I am really happy to see everyone here for this rescheduled event. Hope you enjoyed the snow. <laughs> a quick overview about who we are. Um, Compass Oncology is the only freestanding private practice oncology group left in the Portland area. Um, we are over 35 physicians in five sites of service, and we continue to strive to provide care for you close to home and in your community. We have 15 advanced practice providers and multiple specialties, as you can see listed here. Um, most importantly for tonight, our breast cancer specialty services, which include breast surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, genetic risk evaluation and testing, a high-risk breast cancer clinic, survivorship, palliative care, pathology, what am I forgetting that pertains to breast cancer? I think I covered it, and our, nurse, our wonderful nurse navigators. This is Compass Breast Specialist. Many of these faces I'm sure you'll recognize. And we have three breast cancer nurse navigators now, <laughs> Jennifer Ellery and Superwoman. Um, we have Sue Zaretsky, uh, who is, uh, some of the women are here at this table up front, who runs our high risk program. We have Lisa Clark and Becky Clark, the Clarks run our genetics program. Um, and we are here for all of your breast cancer needs. Um, tonight, you'll hear about the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. That's Dr. Anderson, who was sitting next to me. <laughs> and I said, smile. <laughs> That's what it looks like. It is just a room full of people. It is really great to attend because everybody there is focused on breast cancer. And it's a really exciting meeting, and we're glad to be able to bring some of the highlights back for you. We'd like to thank our community partners for putting this on and helping us to continue to support patients. And tonight we're gonna hear from John Smith, who's gonna talk about techniques to monitor for recurrence. We're gonna hear from Dr. Katie Dunham, who will talk about preventing breast cancer. And then I'll come back and talk about the question on everybody's mind, how long do I have to take my anti-estrogen therapy? And then we'll have a Q&A panel um, there should be cards on your table, so as you think of questions, write down the physician for whom you want to ask the question and what that question is, and we'll collect those for the panel. So I think that means without further ado, we'll go on to Dr. John Smith. So thank you all for coming. And it's always exciting to present uh, the updates at San Antonio at this conference. I have to press the green button. Is that working? Hello? Anybody? <clears throat> anyway, so when I go to San Antonio, I'm always uh, excited to learn about the new stuff as well as the current stuff. And the new stuff is something we're gonna see, not right away, but in a couple years. So I selected two topics to talk about today. And it's the use of circulating tumor cells and the use of circulating tumor DNA to monitor breast cancer, and in some cases to help diagnose uh, or predict recurrence. So the first abstract was presented by Dr. Sperano where he used circulating tumor cells in a group of patients to predict late recurrence in these patients. Now keep in mind that <clears throat> cancer begins locally in the breast, and then after it gets a certain size, blood vessels grow into it. And that allows the cancer not only to spread to lymphatic channels, but also into the bloodstream. And it has to squeeze into the blood vessels. Then it has to survive in the circulation um, because breast cancer cells are bigger than normal red blood cells or white blood cells and can be distorted in this microcirculation in the capillaries. 
Then they have to get out of the bloodstream into the lungs, bones, liver, wherever they end up going. Then they have to grow and recruit their own blood supply. So it's a multi-step process. But during this time, there are cells that circulate in the bloodstream. Now, these cells are quite rare, uh, and they're difficult to identify and isolate. And it's, predict it's thought that there's only about one circulating tumor cell per billion normal blood cells. There is a method to identify them that's now marketed, and it's called the cell search system, and that's what they used in this study. And um, it's approved uh, not for the use that they used it. It's approved for the testing of patients who present with metastatic disease. So the method is a collect blood, a standard amount, one and a half teaspoons, and they centrifuge, centrifuge it to separate the cells from the plasma. Then they add iron particles that are bound to antibodies, and that coats the non-blood cells because it's an antibody against an adhesion molecule. And then with a magnet, they separate those different cells from the normal blood cells. Then they stain them further um, with an antibody to identify the T cells or the immune cells that are in the bloodstream. And then they add a stain to label the nucleus so they can see the nucleus under the microscope. And then it's all done automatically, automated digital fluorescent microscopy. And they come up with the definition of a circulating tumor cell as a cell that's round or oval. It has a nucleus, whereas the red cells don't have nuclei. And it stains for cytokeratins. And it's negative staining for CD45, which is on immune or T cells. So it is a proved test, and it's got a specific approval for metastatic breast cancer. And it's intended to enumerate the number of circulating tumor cells in breast cancer patients with metastatic disease. And the approval was based on the fact that high number of circulating tumor cells were associated with decreased progression, or increased progression, and uh, decreased overall survival. So this is a slide from the publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. And on this side, you see there's the probability of being progression-free. And if you had less than five circulating tumor cells, you had a better progression-free survival than if you had greater than five circulating tumor cells. And that makes sense because it sort of reflects the total bulk of your disease. And the same was true of overall survival. If you had less than five, your overall survival was better than if you had less than five. So although it's approved, it's not used that much. It's not uh, in common use. And <clears throat> I'll get into the reason for that, because it's often not positive, even in patients with metastatic disease. But they have looked at it in patients who have earlier stage disease. And there are two publications, one with 300 patients, one with the 2,000 patients. And basically, patients who had positive CTCs after surgery had a higher recurrence risk than those who didn't. Now, this study was different. It looked at patients five years after they started treatment. And they took patients in a protocol that they had been running and following patients who had stage two and stage three and they were HER2 new negative. And they were cancer free five years after the start of treatment. <clears throat> so they agreed to have the, the test done and they only tested one time point. And the patients weren't aware of the results and neither were the physicians. And there's a short follow up of about two years. And the results showed that overall, only about 5% of patients had a circulating tumor cell identified. 
And it was the same whether you were hormone receptor positive or hormone receptor negative. And there are fewer hormone receptor negative patients. The interesting thing was even five years after diagnosis being cancer free, if you had a circulating tumor cell, your odds of recurrence were much worse than those who were negative. And if you look at the individual test results, um, here's a patient who had, you know, 18 positive circulating tumor cells. And here's one that had 17, et cetera. But there are a whole bunch of patients who had just one circulating tumor cells. And only two of them uh, had recurrence. Whereas four out of six patients who had greater than 10 circulating tumor cells had recurrence in the two years of median follow-up. What's striking to me is that the HER2 new, or the HER, the hormone receptor negative patients, uh, there were eight of them that had circulating tumor cells, yet none of them recurred. And we often think as triple negative patients, as patients that have a more biologically aggressive cancer, and yet none of them recurred. So they concluded that having a circulating tumor cell detected many years out from your primary treatment is not a good prognosis sign. And it supports the clinical validity of studying this in patients to see if there may be some intervention you could then come in with at that time point either prolonged anti-hormonal treatment or maybe treatment with um, CDK4-6 inhibitor. So there are limitations to this uh, test and to this abstract. They only perform the test at one time point. And previous studies have shown that the result can vary within a given time in a given patient. And so if you did the test today and it was negative, you know, and you did the test next week, it might be positive and vice versa. Because many circulating tumor cells uh, die within hours of entering the bloodstream. And the median follow-up is short, as I mentioned, <clears throat> and you would have predicted, predicted it would have made a difference for patients who were triple negative, and yet eight of the patients who had circulating tumor cells, none of them recurred. Also, um, this test doesn't detect cancer cells that haven't changed too much from their cell of origin. So there are some breast cancer cells that really change and get bigger and become triple negative and more aggressive, but the more closely they resemble the breast cancer duct cell or the breast cell uh, duct cell, then it's less likely to be detected. And also, and the thing that bothers me the most is that cytokeratin positive cells can be detected in the blood of few healthy individuals and patients with inflammation. So this is from their um, website. And over here you see <clears throat> patients who have breast cancer. This is colon cancer. This is prostate cancer. And these are two different studies. And in this one study, only half of the patients, 55%, had circulating tumor cells, even though they were known to have metastatic disease. So it doesn't pick up um, the circulating tumor cells in all patients. This one, it was better, it was 71%. But then the benign patients and healthy controls, 3% um, of healthy controls, they had these abnormal cells. I'm not sure they were cancer cells, but they were abnormal cells according to the assay, and 7% of patients with benign disease, inflammatory diseases, had these circulating cells. So it's hard to know what a positive cell means, in my opinion, especially if um, the patient only has one cell. And uh, we know that our patients have other problems. They're not completely healthy all the time. So I'm not real keen on this, but it was presented, and 
it is an assay out there that um, is being used, but please don't ask your doctor for it if you're five years out from surgery because it's something in the future and it needs more uh, validation. And this other present presenter, Dr. Turner, um, mentioned that. And he mentioned that there's no large validation series and a positive result uh, and a negative result um, have different implications because a negative result may be a failure to detect a cancer and a positive result may be a false positive result. So the next part of the talk is DNA that's circulating in the bloodstream. And how does it get there? So if you look at cancer growing and look at healthy tissue and you look at inflamed tissue, a natural thing that occurs in all tissues is some cells age and die. And when they die, bits and pieces of their DNA get into the bloodstream and can be detected, can be detected um, with special assays. Now, there's only a small amount of these circulating tumor DNA or circulating normal DNA, but they're present. And the trick is to be able to identify DNA bits and pieces that come from tumor cells. So <clears throat> uh, it can be extracted and it can be identified as coming from tumor if there's a genetic mutation identified or abnormality that is unique to the cancer. And they can detect point mutations or copy number fluctuations or structural rearrangements. And this can be used <clears throat> as a liquid biopsy is a key name for it. For, a pa for example, a patient with lung cancer, if they got circulating tumor DNA at this point and the tumor shrinks, there may be uh, emergence of some resistance and that causes new metastasis, but if you drew the circulating tumor DNA at all these different time points, you may see a new mutation emerge. And in fact, they have a new test that we're using currently in patients with lung cancer, which is designed to detect a special mutation that emerges in patients who have an EGFR mutation and become resistant to the first line treatment. And you can just draw blood from that patient. And if you detect this T790 mutation, then you can put them on a new medicine and you don't have to try and stick a needle in their lung, which is difficult to do. So it could be used to monitor patients as their cancer changes with time and with treatment. Now this paper was in the New England Journal of Medicine um, three years ago. And it looked at the circulating tumor DNA to monitor patients who had metastatic disease. And this was um, the circulating biomarker here. And they looked at, in the blue, circulating tumor DNA. And in the green, CA153, a common tumor marker in breast cancer. And in the yellow, uh, circulating tumor cells. So you can see here that during this whole time, the circulating tumor cells did not increase. The CA153 didn't change too much, whereas the circulating tumor DNA was high at the start, and they got treated with chemotherapy and went down to a non-detectable level. And then as um, it went up, the patient developed obvious progression. So the rise preceded the clinical progression of disease, and when the treatment was changed, it came back down again. So they looked at it in about 30 patients, and they showed that 29 out of the 30 uh, actually had very good prediction of progression of disease with the circulating tumor DNA. The problem is that you have to have uh, the patient's primary cancer and normal tissue, and you have to identify abnormalities 
that are in the genes of the tumor cell. And we know that for a cancer to become a cancer, the normal cell has to change. It has to mutate, has to overexpress genes, delete genes, et cetera. And those mutations aren't always easily discovered. So <clears throat> when they looked at 15,000 patients with advanced stage cancer and they sequenced their whole genome, that included 14% uh, of the patients with breast cancer, and they were able to detect um, circulating tumor DNA in about 83%. And it was concordant with the tissue biopsies in 87%, and even higher, 98%, that the biopsy was done within six months. And here are some mutations um, that can be detected. Like in that previous study, they looked at PIK3CA mutations, and they looked at P53 mutations. But here you can see the majority of patients, there weren't any mutations detected. Um, and so they looked um, for estrogen receptor uh, mutations, AKT mutations, and small amounts of them were found. And that's the limit of this um, technique, is you have to have an abnormal um, gene that you're going to probe for in the circulating tumor DNA that sets it apart. When Nicholas Turner presented this update of patients that were being tested um, at the time, they were starting neoadjuvant chemotherapy for large breast cancer. And they identified uh, from the tumor different gene mutations. And then they subsequently were monitoring the patients with circulating tumor DNA. And the normal DNA is called wild-type DNA, and then the mutant DNA was identified here. And, as, and so they did um, core biopsy at diagnosis, they did blood sample at diagnosis, and then they got neoadjuvant chemotherapy, then they had surgery. And post-surgery, they collected blood samples every six months. And what they found in different patients was sometimes um, at the time of baseline, there was these mutant DNA that was detected that went down to zero after surgery and remained that way 24 months afterwards. This other patient, the mutant DNA was detected before starting treatment. And afterwards, there were seven copies still detected. And six months later, there are many more copies and the patient clinically progressed. So having a negative um, circulating tumor DNA was a good sign after surgery. And this is a graph that shows disease-free survival on this axis. And if they did not detect any circulating tumor DNA, then you had a very good cancer-free survival of 90% or greater. Whereas 13 patients who did have circulating tumor DNA uh, showed progression over the next 20 months. And this also translated in worse overall survival. So they are doing a study now where they're tracking patients who have a baseline tumor biopsy that shows a genetic abnormality that they can uh, detect with circulating tumor DNA assays. And they do that at baseline and every three months in year one. And they're focusing on high-risk triple negative breast cancer. And if the circulating tumor DNA comes up positive, they will randomize the patients to getting an immune therapy with pembrolizumab for a year or observation. If they can see obvious cancer in the lungs or liver, et cetera, they will get standard treatment. But if all they have is circulating tumor DNA, then they will see if an intervention can help get rid of that circulating tumor DNA and improve their cancer-free survival. So that's a study that's just begun and we'll be interested to find out what happens. So the conclusions are both circulating tumor cells and circulating tumor DNA can be used to monitor patients on or after breast cancer treatment. They may benefit 
it, this may be able to benefit select patients, um, and we may be able to use it to identify patients who wouldn't benefit from prolonged adjuvant treatment, and Lucy's going to talk about that later. But it's not ready for prime time yet. And circulating tumor DNA can be used up front to detect mutations unique to the cancer and to monitor during, during treatment and also be used to change treatment as the cancer evolves. So coming soon to a laboratory near you is the DNA assay, but it's not ready yet, but we look forward to it to use in breast cancer over the next five, maybe 10 years. So thank you very much. <laughs>